Here with us virtually, of course, we start with Julianne Grimm, editor and publisher of the Santa Fe Reporter. We also welcome back Dan McKay from the Albuquerque Journal's Capitol Bureau. Also with us is Jessica Onsures, news director at the Carlsbad Current Argus. And we welcome to the virtual table for the first time, Algernon Damasa of the Las Cruces Sun News. Thank you, Algernon, for joining us. Coming in at number 10, guys, on our non-scientific list, New Mexico found itself at the center of the entertainment world in 2021, but for all the wrong reasons. An investigation is still going into a shooting on the set of the film Rust near Santa Fe involving actor and producer Alec Baldwin. Mr. Baldwin is now claiming he didn't even pull the trigger when the gun went off, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins. And Julianne, this happened at the famed Bonanza Ranch near Santa Fe, a place of some pride around here. Has this taken some of the shine off this industry that has been, you know, such a beacon of economic development and other things for the last decade for us? I mean, I think the appetite the American public has for violence in film and television is not diminished by this tragedy that mm -hmm. happened in Santa Fe, um, to answer your question. But, mm -hmm. but I do think that this... Um, you know, story was really interesting for the local press because it's really a Hollywood story mm -hmm. that happened in our neighborhood um, versus like a New Mexico story, um, you know, that has a, a real sense of place here. It's like mm -hmm. all the, the, the cast of characters, if you will, the decision makers, um, many of the attorneys who subsequently get involved um, are really centered in Los Angeles. And so you're seeing the LA Times do a lot of really good journalism around this topic, um, mm -hmm. along with lots of other national media. Lots and lots and lots, absolutely. Dan McKay, interesting, a lot to talk about corners allegedly being cut on the set and, you know, the role that may have played in the tragedy. You know, we talked about this before, but does this stick to New Mexico film workers themselves? Do we get a bad reputation once the dust has settled on all of this? Well, that's difficult to say. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there is definitely increased debate uh, throughout the country about the safety uh, of film workers, uh, workers in general, but also the conditions on film sets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, legis the legislature had a recent hearing on uh, film incentives and the tax program, and uh, the shooting did not come up, which I thought was really interesting mm -hmm. that it was um, a topic that either by coincidence or by agreement was didn't surface in this major hearing over over uh, the expenditure of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Jessica. When you really think about it, it's interesting the timing. This all came about out on the heels of a historic vote by IATSE unions to authorize a strike in part of a work conditions. That strike appears to have been averted, as we all know. But does this raise red flags about how much the film industry has its own house in order? Definitely. I think um, a lot of the big questions prior to talk of a strike was not only the safety of the workers, but really working conditions all around. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned, they did end up not striking and they ended up signing up an, an agreement that addresses some of these kinds of things like raises and pensions and health care. Um, but also maybe speaking to what happened in, in the Rust film set, things like getting enough rest time in between shifts for the workers who are on these film sets. So um, it's great to see that they're focusing more on on safety of these, you know, workers who are always behind the scenes. It's not the people that you see in front of the camera, but the people behind the camera. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to see that they're focusing on safety there. Yeah. Algernon, I'm curious, you know, Las Cruces has, 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 has its share of film activity. Has this been an issue for in the Las Cruces area in southern New Mexico? I think that you have a similar conversation in Las Cruces that you do across the industry mm -hmm. as far as uh, safety and pay. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how to develop the infrastructure needed to attract more production work mm -hmm. and generate more employment. But it's not just about landing a job and earning money. It's also about the quality of life while you're working as well as safety and the feeling you have when you go home at the end of the day. Safety does take time. And in the film industry, time really is money. The cliche holds true. And so the concessions that are needed to assure firearm safety and other weapons and, and other uh, fireworks, explosives and things that we do on sets mm -hmm. uh, is just crucially part of that conversation. And it's going to cost the industry money. Mm -hmm. You know, Julianne, there was a lot of speculation. I, again, I mentioned this before about the gun being used for target practice on the set for bottles and cans and that kind of thing. You know, it's a period gun, of course. And I, I just I got to wonder how this affects people who were professionals in the business in Santa Fe. 
Again, we're kind of asking the same question, just in a different way, but I'm just really curious. Something has to be talked about in Santa Fe, it seems to me, about maybe self-policing a little bit better on film sets to avoid these things? Well, I mean, the, the gun that was used was a Colt 45 revolver. I mm -hmm. think that a lot of people in the West are really familiar with that weapon. It's a weapon that's depicted on television and, and in film a lot. Um, it's a weapon that requires the hammer to be drawn back before the bullet can be discharged. And the bullet is only discharged when someone touches the trigger. Mm -hmm. And um, contrary to you know the narrative that Alec Baldwin gave on national television, um, you know, something else happened. I think the investigation right. is slow uh, to the eyes of, again, people are kind of used to CSI solving things on television in 60 minutes. Good but, point. you know, this incident <laughs> happened on October 21st in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. The Santa Fe County Sheriff is in charge of the investigation. They have sent ballistics to the FBI. Uh, we're not sure if those are back or not, but it, they would appear to not be. We haven't heard anything about them. Uh, the district attorney here in Santa Fe was really pressured, I think, by that ABC special into giving a statement um, in which she really said nothing about the charges. You know, charges haven't been filed yet. Mm -hmm. Charges still could be filed. Um, you know, she didn't say this, Mary uh, Carmack outlines is her name, but, mm -hmm. you know, Alec Baldwin has gone on television, um, not only saying he didn't pull the trigger, but also saying that he's pretty confident he's not going to be charged. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that confidence is, is well placed. Um, and I, I can't help but think that if this incident happened between, say, two local filmmakers who were shooting in their backyard, mm -hmm. um, if one of them wouldn't be sitting in jail mm. right now. That's, a, that's an interesting point. I had not thought of that angle. That's interesting. Hey, Dan, let's finish with this. You sort of touched on this earlier. I appreciate it. I want to bring it back about what could be done, be done by the state to protect film workers here in New Mexico. Is there any kind of a movement you're hearing that asking for legislation? Uh, I haven't heard anything about legislation at this mm -hmm. point. I do think that there are um, administrative uh, actions that can be taken. Um, by the occupational workplace safety uh, agencies within the state. Um, so I do think that's a possibility. Uh, as I said, I am interested to see how the shooting, uh, you know, what role it plays in sort of this broader political debate about right. supporting the film industry in New Mexico and, um, it, and its contributions to the economy. Mm -hmm. Good points there. Hey, moving now to our ninth biggest story of 2021, Cheryl Williams Stapleton was a roundhouse fixture for more than two decades, but that all came to an abrupt end after an early morning raid and subsequent indictment on charges she embezzled money at her job at Albuquerque Public Schools. Ms. Williams Stapleton has continued to claim her innocence, but she did resign her seat in the State House of Representatives just days after that raid. And Dan, I'm going to start with you. What sticks out to you from New Mexico's latest political scandal? Uh, well, I think one of the interesting things is that, um, you know, Cheryl Williams Stapleton may not have had quite as high a profile as, say, a governor or a House speaker, but um, she was the number two person in the House. She mm -hmm. has um, uh, um, a kind of a really dominant personality. I mean, she's just um, she's one of those people who when she speaks in a debate, um, it's just very forceful mm -hmm. and kind of everybody pays attention and she was not shy about uh, confronting people within her own party, much less people in the other party. Um, so I, I feel like the Roundhouse just, uh, it feels like a different place without sort of that kind of big dominant personality. Mm -hmm. Al Algernon, we've done a lot in recent years to try and cut down on these types of scandals, including creating the state's first independent ethics commission. But what are we still missing here that allowed this to apparently happen? Well, I'm not really sure. And that's the thing is that an ethics commission uh, responds to things and establishes the line of play mm -hmm. and and interprets. But, you know, those are those are reactive features. And, you know, I don't know that an ethics commission can be looked to as a way to prevent things from happening. This is really about how do you respond when something does happen, whether it's accidental or premeditated. Mm -hmm. Good points there. Jessica, you don't, you, Albuquerque Public Schools is not exactly around the corner from you, but I want to tell you they recently approved new procurement processes after the scandal. Apparently, they didn't have an official procurement policy in place before, especially around sole source contracts, which around these parts is a real difficulty, sole source. 
APS did alert authorities to these allegations, but should they have done more to protect against it in the first place? Well, so definitely I think that one of the things that every school district that I've ever worked with is focus is on policies and procedures in place and making, making sure that there are um, ways to catch this. And, and to APS's credit, they did have an employee who saw something funny, um, spoke up and actually did the right thing, which led to all of this. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking, should they do more? Definitely. Those are public dollars that we're talking about. Um, they're... Um, the, the thing to take away from this, I think, is that we should be paying more attention, not just our own employee, the employees with, within school districts, mm -hmm. but those of us in the public who see these um, contracts go into place and these contracts awarded. We should be paying attention. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting, uh, Algernon, the scandal pushes us all away from us. Does the scandal push us at all away from a citizen legislature? The reason I ask that, has the time come to make these paid jobs or do you see momentum increasing towards that idea? I don't know that something like this necessarily turns the public against the idea of a citizen legislature because there's so much suspicion about a professional political class, we might say, mm -hmm. and their susceptibility to corruption. Um, I think wherever there's opportunity, access, power, um, you're going to run into uh, pockets where corruption can take place. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe the idea isn't that we should be moving towards um, a corruption-free world, although we can certainly minimize it, but <laughs> really have a world where we respond clearly and effectively to corruption, mm -hmm. whether the uh, legislators are citizens or not. I do think, however, that that doesn't excuse us from having the conversation we need to have about a legislative body where people are part-time and unpaid except for per diems mm -hmm. and how that may press people to directions that might include corruption or uh, at least uh, the appearance of that. And yeah. so um, I don't know that it really pushes us in one direction or another, but it shows one more reason that we have to have that conversation and consider the merits of a well-paid, well-monitored legislative body. I'd like to allow you all to take a kind of a cut at this question because it's an interesting one. I get this feedback all the time about the citizen legislature. And Julianne, you know, same question. Does this move us one way or the other about part-time paid, unpaid people? Or is there something more to come out of this? I mean, I, I don't really feel like that's the big takeaway from mm -hmm. this particular incident. You know, this person was employed by APS and a pretty good job and had a good salary, also had a business that was um, apparently right. operating and, and relatively successful, a restaurant in Albuquerque. So I'm not sure you can make the argument that like poverty drove someone to corruption. Um, I, you know, I like the way that, that Algernon framed it about an, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, as someone who's running a small business, um, watching every expenditure, every penny that we spend on records requests, it is really hard to conceive of someone being able to make this sort of get away with a million dollars of public money. Right. Uh, we just got a press release this week about someone from Sandia Labs who got prosecuted for spending $136,000 on a lab credit card oh, wow. for uh, personal purchases. And it's really hard for me to comprehend how that scale uh, of, of fraud and, and corruption can occur in these organizations. I, I'm pretty baffled by it. Interesting points. I'm glad you got that in. Dan, uh, same question again. Are you hearing any scuttle even among the legislatures that perhaps this situation moved them one way or the other about part-time versus full-time? Uh, people have been pretty careful about what they say about this publicly. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's been a movement in the legislature um, uh, for several years now looking for ways to uh provide them with a salary right now they they do get reimbursement for costs and per diem but they don't draw a specific salary uh, and there's been a lot of debate over providing a salary so that um a broader uh selection of people could run mm -hmm. um so it could be that the cheryl william stapleton uh indictment surfaces in that debate and is used as a tool to to push uh some of these ideas that they've already been kicking around um but at, at this point, you know, people, uh, it's been a topic people shy away from speaking about publicly. Yeah, that's a good point there. Jessica, same, you know, do you have a sense where you're sitting that perhaps this is pushing citizens or even legislatures down your way one way or the other? 
You know, I think I would echo what Julianne said on, on all those fronts, maybe dive a little bit deeper and say that it's, well, it's not pushing one way or the other. There are conversations I think need to happen um, that talk about really the entrenchment of power in, in Santa Fe, right? We are, it, this was pretty shocking because we're talking about a legislator, a legislator who is well-known, loved, um, had pretty extensive power within, within the ranks there. And um, how could someone not notice what was happening is, is the big question. That's an interesting point there. Um, Algernon, interesting when you think about it, we've had two special sessions to deal with redistricting, cannabis, and a few other things. Is it about money? I mean, we seem to have plenty of money, so it really can't be that. Well, uh, it's not entirely about money, mm -hmm. but I mean, just because there's revenue coming into state coffers does not necessarily feel to the citizen that they have opportunities mm -hmm. to thrive and succeed. And uh, I mean, if we're talking about cannabis, I think that cannabis is sort of this wide, it opens this wide open space uh, for where people imagine that they will have an opportunity for enterprise, as long as they also bear in mind that it's uh, uh, the, the, the costs up front of entering that marketplace are tend to be higher than people expect when right. they're just getting in. Yeah, good point there. And down your way, hemp as well. Uh, it's an expensive proposition to get into. That's all the time we have on those topics. Still ahead this week, our sixth and seventh top stories of the year. Plus, Necessity breeds innovation when it comes to efforts to make sure everyone has enough to eat here in New Mexico.